So since we started working within the BBS clinic service, we've been aware that many patients with Bader Beadle syndrome struggle with irritable bowel type issues. So BBS UK conducted an audit a few years ago, which seemed to confirm what we were hearing. And that's been backed up by dietitians' observations within the service. So we are pushing for more awareness and research into this. But in the meantime, we have invited Kenny Slater, a BBS dietitian for the Birmingham Adult Service, to talk to us about what irritable bowel syndrome is and to give some practical suggestions for its effective management. Do we have Kelly? Are you able to join us? Yeah, can you hear me? Um, I have clicked to stop my video, so hopefully you can. Can you see me now? Um, not quite, not yet. Okay. Um, there we see. go. Okay, you got it. <laughs> Hi, Kelly. <laughs> Hello. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to hand over to you, Sue, when you're ready, feel free to go ahead. Okay, brilliant. So, hi, everyone. Um, I know probably some of you. Um, I am the dietitian at Queen Elizabeth Hospital um, for BBS, and I'm hopefully able to share my video. Can you let me just start the uh, slideshow and then hopefully. There we go. Can we all see that? Yes. Yeah, brilliant. Um, so yeah, I've been asked to talk about IBS, so irritable bowel syndrome. It affects everyone, um, but someone was asking if there was a higher, um, if more people had it, if they had to have BBS as well. So I have to do a little bit of research, a bit of digging. But if people don't know what irritable bowel syndrome is, um, I'll just start off with a little bit of this first. So there's, oh, bear with me a second. So IBS is a collection of symptoms because it's a syndrome. So it's a lot of symptoms. People can get some of them or people can get all of them. So it could be things like tummy pain, um, like diarrhea, constipation, or it could be a mixture of those two. Um, the diet and medicines can often help with these symptoms. And, but the problem is we don't know the exact cause of why some people get IBS and some people don't. There are some theories that say it could be like stress related. It could be that the food passes through the gut too quickly or too slowly. Um, some people notice that maybe if they've had like a bit of food poisoning, then the IBS symptoms um, carry on after that as well. So the diagnosis of IBS, unfortunately, there's no one test that a doctor can do to say, you've got definitely IBS or you haven't. But it is really important that the doctors do some um, tests to rule out any possible other causes. Um, an assessment for IBS could be considered if you've had some of these symptoms for at least six months. So it could be like abdominal pain or bloating, any change in bowel habits that you've noticed. If, as I say, if you've had any of those, then definitely go to your GP and they can do some investigations. IBS should not be diagnosed if there's no investigation done. You can't just say, oh, I've got a bit of tummy pain, so I've got IBS. You need to get investigated first. So the incidence of it, it's the most common disorder um, of the digestive system. So that's like all your tummy and your, your, your guts, basically. Um, and it affects the five to 20% of the general population. Um, so it's quite fairly, quite a big proportion of the population can get it. As I say, I was doing a bit of digging to see if there's any research with BBS, with irritable bowel syndrome. The only thing that I could find is the clinical registry um, investigating BBS, and that's in the United States. And it's a study quite a few years ago that got 550 people with BBS, and it shows just over 3% of the pop of that group had IBS symptoms of like the pain, the cramping, bloating, that sort of thing. Um, so then the study showed that IBS in BBS, it's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it, um, was, is actually less common than in the general population. However, this study only had like 550 people, um, it tried to be inclusive with um, everyone with lots of different ethnicities and things like that, but we still don't know. But if, if anyone's got any symptoms, I'd say go to your GP about it. So the dietary advice, 
the main dietary advice it's kind of healthy eating which we all should be doing anyway um the main things is to eat three regular meals a day and try not to eat too late at night why I say that is that when we're in bed our bodies do lots of other things to um to heal and lots of different things that it's meant to be doing it shouldn't be having to try and digest loads of food as well we say drink at least I'd say six to eight glasses or cups of fluid every day. So a glass of normally or a cup is normally about 250 mils. So if you had about eight glasses, that'd be like your two litres per day. If at the moment you're not getting that, I'd just slowly increase it in time. Um, and it could be water, herbal teas, anything that you think is quite good for you, not, not sugary drinks. We say limit your alcohol intake to no more than two units per day and have at least a couple of days without alcohol in a week. Um, two units is, well, alcohol intake's kind of got stronger over the years as well. So two units might be a small to a medium glass of wine or um, maybe a pint of beer, but now alcohol in beer's got a lot stronger. So a pint of beer could have like three or four units in it. So it's not much really, the recommendations. Uh, we say to you, reduce caffeine intake, no more than two mugs per day. If you do have a lot, lot more than that, again, I'd say to slowly reduce it in time. Um, otherwise, I know some people that drink lots and lots of caffeine, so tea, coffee, coke, those sort of things. Um, if you stop it completely you can actually feel quite quite bad with it so you get like withdrawal effects so reduce it slowly maybe have one coffee in the morning and then go to a decaf that sort of thing uh reduce fizzy drinks imagine fizz if you've got gas or anything like that that fizz just doesn't make your symptoms any better <laughs> um reduce fatty things which i said about healthy eating all comes back to this. So try to avoid your fried foods, your crisps, your chocolate cakes, fast foods, pies, those sort of things. They can um, react to the gut. Some people notice that they can either have more of a sluggish bowel habit or quite often it can go straight through them and they have to run to the toilet with them. Uh, this one's a bit of a weird one for me to say, limit portions of fruit. So we say don't have more than three portions of fruit per day if you've got IBS. Um, but it is really important that you have vegetables. So still have a mixture, still aim for your five fruit and vegetables a day. Additional advice. So say to not to avoid, well, to avoid chewing chewing gum um, and then chew food really well and take time to eat. Those two things, it's really important because when we put the food in our mouth or even like chewing gum, anything, our brain signals to our stomach and our guts to say, oh, we're going to have to do some work here. We're going to have to digest our food. So uh, it, if you're chewing chewing gum, it, you got, your brain's like tricked into thinking that you're going to have some food. So then your tummy's like doing some funny things. It could be gurgling or it could even be bloated because it's waiting for some food inside it. Um, and that's the same thing as chewing food really well. So you, we start our digestive, um, as soon as our digestion, as soon as we're starting to chew our food. So we don't want to have our stomachs full of really solid foods. We want to make sure we chew it really well. And that helps our body to digest it a bit easier. If you have got loads of symptoms, it might be worth writing a food and symptom diary or taking pictures of your food if you're finding it difficult to write it down or you can type it up. Um, whatever's easiest for you. I wouldn't do it for too long, maybe a week or two. And especially if you are going to see a dietitian, for example, because then you can show the dietitian and say, look, this is what I've been eating and these are my symptoms. And then hopefully with working with someone, we might be able to figure out what the cause is. Um, but then what I would say is that when we do eat, we might not have a symptom straight away. So you might think, oh, I've got a symptom now, just eat and such and such, like a sandwich, for example. And it's definitely that. 
but it could have been something that you might have eaten earlier on in the day. And that's why it's that's why we say to try and have the food diary for a couple of weeks so we can see a pattern. Uh, some of the advice though is try probiotics. So you need those little drinks that you can get, um, or you can have a yogurt form or even like a tablet form. It can help with some symptoms. If you were going to try it, just try one brand, so one particular make, try it for four weeks. If you think that hasn't really helped with my symptoms, you could try a different brand because there's different types of bacteria in different brands. There are alternatives out there with diets. Um, one of them is called a low FODMAP diet. It's got a really, really long name. That's why we just call it FODMAP. Um, it can help with IBS. However, it's really, really difficult to follow. Um, always, I would always say make sure that you are referred to someone like a dietitian too, because it's a restrictive diet to start with. You rule out lots of things and then slowly, slowly reintroduce foods to see what helps with the symptoms. I don't use it with people with IBS because I think it's quite difficult to follow and you have to be reading lots of packaging and it's, it's just very difficult. So I would rather do the other advice that I mentioned first. If that's not working, then go and be referred to a dietitian. There are other um, things out there as well. So some evidence is, say, is you could try hypnotherapy or CBT, especially if it's, you think that stress is causing the symptoms. There, are, there is evidence out there to say that these can help. So it might not always be food. I've put here um, a, a QR code because that's a lot of the information um, that I've mentioned is on this. So you could always use that if you wanted. And I have got a reference list as well. I'm sure these all can be shared if you need to. So I'll leave that up for a few seconds. Um, I have gone through that quite quickly, but there's so much information now out there and I didn't want to bombard you too much. So this is the evidence-based practice. There's a lot of information on the internet which isn't evidence-based, so I don't want anyone to go on a silly diet and cause more problems. But I'm happy to have any questions that you've got. And there's the... So I'll leave that for now. I'll stop sharing. Any questions? Thanks so much, Kelly. So. The um, stats that you shared, so the um, struggling to find any data out there and we felt the same, but would you agree that what we're seeing um, within the clinical space and sort of hearing anecdotally is that it does seem very prevalent in the community, but we're just not finding any research to back that up? Yeah, I mean, I really struggle. I was looking for any sort of research, especially with BBS. I mean, as you know, that's, there's not much research out there. So, um, with with anecdotally what we see people have these symptoms and it's really difficult in the clinics that we have obviously because we can't follow people up so i always say to patients to anyone with ebs to say get referred to a gp especially if you've got these symptoms for a long time and then ask to be referred to a dietitian the only problem is a lot of local dietitians might not know about bbs so if you do have an appointment with the dietitian, I would always say maybe contact them beforehand to say, look, this is what I've got. I've got BBS. We don't, we're not taught at a university. Um, we're taught different things like prada willy syndrome, syndrome. But so it'd be worth, if anyone does see anyone locally, it's to say, look, this is what BBS is because otherwise I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. And there's one more question. So yep. you were saying about the, the lack of knowledge at the local level with local dietitians. Is it possible to link them up with the BBS dietitians so that they can learn from the expertise that's there? Yeah, I mean, it's a bit of a tricky one as well because we're not there all the time. Um, and we can, um, so I've contacted dietitians in the past, um, local dietitians to say that if people have had problems to say, oh, they really didn't get me, for example. Um, and I'm hopefully there will be publishing a bit more things to dietitians so we have got our own groups um 
and hopefully I can just spread the word a little bit to say what BBS is. That's my aim anyway, just to get the word out there so everyone knows what it is. That's great. Thank you so much for that. Is there any other questions? I don't think there is, is there? That's unusual. I talk about diet and most people there's loads of questions about food. Everyone loves food. <laughs> It was um, it was comprehensive, but if there are any more um, questions, please yes, everyone do send them through, and we will liaise with uh, Kelly to get those answered. Yeah. Um, thank you, Kelly.